you all for coming out. This evening it is great to see so many people. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you about biofilk design. So um, I'm a project landscape architect at Bradley Murphy Design based outside Birmingham in the UK. Um, I'm also an independent biofilk design advocate and consultant. Um, I've co-authored several case studies and reports on biofilk design, including terpene bright beans, uh, 14 patterns of biofilk design, and I've had work appear in MIT's International Journal of Architecture Research, uh, Landscape Architecture Frontiers, and the Landscape Institute's Journal Landscape. Um, I've also done work with the UK Living Building Challenge Collaborative in organizing biofilk design workshops for the first uh, Living Building Challenge registered uh, project in the UK, uh, the Curden Valley Park uh, Visitor Centre. So, what is biophilia? Biophilia is a love of life. It is an innate affinity to associate with nature. It states that humans have a deep-seated association to natural environments. Essentially, our brains are hardwired for nature. Now, biophilia, as a term, was first coined by a psychologist in the 1960s called Eric Fromm, and it was popularized and developed as a concept by Edward O. Wilson in his publication, Biophilia and the Conserva Conservation Ethic. So the application of biophilia is known as biophilic design, a design ethic that's relatively still in its infancy. Its aim is to restore natural stimuli to the built environment and enhance the cognitive psychophysiological well-being of urban inhabitants. Biophilic design has been shown to have economic, health, cultural, environmental value, and ecological benefits. It's not simply about the presence of nature, but the content within the space, its configuration, and associated semantic content. Simply put, it is more than tokenistic greenery. It's also worth pointing out that biophilic design does not have to be big or expensive and should not be exclusive. People like to call biophilic design by numerous terms, restorative environmental design, designing with nature. It is simply an extension of good design. So, the benefits of biophilic design. In as little as between five and 20 minutes within a biophilic environment, a positive restorative response can occur. Benefits from these responses include decreases in blood pressure, heart rate, and stress hormones, increases in self-esteem and positive psychological mood, enhanced cognitive function, concentration, memory, restoration, and directional attention. All benefits that are important for interior office environments and for urban living. Other benefits of biophilic environments include reduced levels of crime and aggression, increased land values, lower rates of employee absenteeism, increased he healing rates in patients in hospital settings, and social cohesion. Now, these restorative responses that I um, speak about are based on their nature, what's called nature-health relationships. And these restorative responses are rapid, automatic, and unconscious. And they can be divided into three subcategories. The first of these is physiological, so blood pressure, heart rate, your neurotransmitter, and hormone production. The restoration of the physiological mind-body system can help buffer individuals to environmental stress and pre prevent system damage. However, the physiological system also needs to be regularly tested, but only to the degree of the body, for the body to remain resilient and adaptive to environmental stressors. So some form of environmental stress through design can actually be beneficial to the body. And then moving on to the second um, category, you have cognitive. This is your attention, your creativity, your task of performance, and mental agility. This is what can be referred to as, um, sorry, as uh, your uh, mental agility, or sorry, cognitive um, mind-body systems uh, control your directional attentional capacity, your ability to complete a task. And this directed attention is required for many tasks um, anything from routine tasks, sending emails, writing reports, and over time, this results in mental fatigue. Being in a biophilic environment can um, restore your cognitive functions and increase um, per, uh, performance. And the final one is psychological. So this is your mood, self-esteem, um, your perception, and your level of place attachment. So this is a response mechanism that's heavily influenced by societal norms, cultural, um, past uh, experience, and genetics. And now from the 14 patterns of biofilic design, you have um, the various benefits um, from each of the patterns associated with them and the corresponding papers that back up the research. 
Um, just quickly flicking through these, and these are all available um, for download from uh, Terrapin Bright Green's website um, and within their 14 parents publication as well. So why do we need biophilic environments? Well, we know now that proximity to green spaces influences health outcomes with higher levels of mortality for areas with lower levels of access to green space. Yet increased um, urbanization is leading to a loss of green space, exacerbated with the fact that we spend 90% of our time indoors. And recently it was shown that three quarters of UK children now spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. Underlying the importance of biophilic design in our built environment, we should also consider the following. As stress is now the biggest cause of sickness in the UK, costing 105 million working days per year, affecting 20% of the working population, costing the UK economy 6.5 billion annually, while the cost of maintaining 27,000 green spaces annually is only 630 million. Um, in an Irish context, absenteeism costs Irish employers 1.5 billion euro a year, with studies from the US with, it from, with studies from the US showing that 10% um, of employee absence can be attributed to architecture with no connection to nature. So according to the 14 patterns of biophilic design, good design, good biophilic design is designing for people as a biological organ, um, organism. And this is respecting the mind-body systems as indicators of health and well-being in the context of what's locally appropriate and responsive. Good biophilic design draws from influential perspectives such as the health baselines, social and cultural constructs, and the past experiences of the user groups you're de um, designing for. Above all else, biophilic design must nurture a love of place. So 14 patterns of biophilic design were published by Terrapin and Bright Green in 2014, and they have a wide range of applications and are meant to be flexible and adaptive allowing for project appropriate um, implementation across various sectors and scales. Due to the fact that no two applications of a biophilic design pattern will result in the same solution, these patterns will not create a rigid uh, design process, but will instead inform, guide, and assist in the design process, resulting in a locally appropriate solution because they respond to the local context of the site, the project, and its predicted users. So why are we using patterns? Well, first off, the descriptive term pattern is being used because it proposes a clear and standardized terminology for biophilic design, as many other terms have been used to describe um, biophilic design previously, attributes, characteristics, um, and so on. Um, it also maximizes accessibility across the design professions by using a familiar language. Um, the use of spatial patterns is inspired by precedents set in Christopher Alexander's publication, um, A Pattern Language, and uh, the publication Designing with People in Mind by the Kaplans. Um, Alexander's publication focuses on the psychological benefits of um, patterns as a designer's response and solution to problems encountered in the built environment, whereas the 14 patterns of biophilic design go further than this and focus on not only the psychological, but the physiological and cognitive benefits as well. Now, biophilic design patterns can be broken down into three categories. You have nature of the space, natural analogs, and nature in the space. Now, the first of these, sorry, is nature in the space. And this is direct and physical and temporal presence of nature in a space. They include plant, war, animal, um, life, uh, as well as breezes, sounds, scents, and other natural elements. The strongest responses um, to biophilic design are achieved through this category, and they're achieved through using direct connections with nature, particularly when you have a diversity of patterns combined together when you incorporate movement and multi-sensory interactions. Now, the first pattern within this category is known as visual connection to nature. This is the degree to which an individual can establish visual contact to elements of nature in a manner that triggers a positive psychological response or physiological response as well. It's been shown through studies to reduce stress, improve positive emotional functioning, and enhance concentration and healing rates. And this can be achieved through the use of green walls in the office, uh, a water feature, or by positioning windows um, along the facade of a building um, towards a park or local green space. The second pattern we have is non-visual connection to nature. 
And this is the degree to which an individual can um, utilize their sense of hearing, uh, taste, uh, smell, um, to connect with interactive elements of nature. Um, and this, in turn, uh, has been shown, especially in regard to exposure to nature sounds, when compared to urban or office noise, it accelerates uh, physiological <coughs> restoration up to 40% faster after a uh, psychological stressor. And third pattern we have is non-rhythmic sensory stimuli. And this can simply be um, explained by the swaying of grasses in the wind. They are um, unpredictable, temporal, uh, random occurrences of nature that happen. Um, so in contrast to the previous two patterns, the individual is passively experiencing um, nature. They're not actively <coughs> going out to seek the experience. And this pattern should seek when used um, to uh, hold someone's attention out the peripheral vision for greater than 20 seconds, and it's usually more effective when used from distances of greater than six meters away. Now, all these um, parameters and numbers that I'm stating off, uh, they're available in greater detail in the 14 patterns of biofilm design uh, publication. Uh, the next pattern we have is thermal and airflow variability. And this is essentially allowing an individual um, to be in control of their own thermal comfort. This can be something as simple as allowing access to a manual window in an office environment that they can open, or an exterior setting having movable seating, or designing microclimates within a space. The next pattern we have is presence of water. So this allows individuals to establish visual, um, auditory, or tactile contact with water in a manner that engenders a positive psychological or physiological response. It's been shown to reduce stress, heart rate, and blood pressure, and increase feelings of tranquility. Um, it improves concentration, restores memory, and when um, experiencing visually complex uh, water features, such as a waterfall or a babbling brook, it leads to um, greater memory restoration and improvement in attentional capacity. In terms of um, design considerations, uh, the water body should occupy no more than 60% of the space, any more can feel imposing. Um, and it's also very important to allow for um, tactile contact with the water, to actually allow um, users of space to be able to touch the water. However, it's, it's not always possible due to health and safety, etc. but it should be encouraged. Now we have dynamic and diffuse um, lighting. So this characterizes a space that leverages varying intensities of light and shadow that change over time. Uh, numerous studies have shown that um, artificial light over time, especially for night shift workers, factory workers, nurses, um, being under artificial light can have serious negative effects on the human body in terms of upsetting the, uh, hum uh, the body's uh, circadian rhythm, which in turn uh, regulates um, hormone and neurotransmitter production in the body and dysregulation of the circadian rhythm um, can lead to higher instances of diabetes and breast cancer. Um, so it's important with this as well, not just in interior environments, but in terms of exterior environments for urban design, um, in utilizing light where you need to, but um, using cutoff points and uh, keeping in mind strategies for minimizing uh, light pollution. Now, the final part in this category is connection with natural systems. This can be perhaps one of the hardest patterns to implement as you're trying to um, implement a design feature that makes users aware of natural processes and of ecosystem process, um, processes happening within a space. Um, it can be achieved through the use of seasonal or temporal changes within um, a space, uh, seasonal fluctua fluctuations in water table, water movement, or through the use of seasonal vegetation. Um, this is the green roof from Cook Fox Architects' um, sorry, offices in Midtown Manhattan. Um, so throughout the year, the green roof changes color. It goes from yellow to green to red. Um, and aside from this, um, the occupants of the office, uh, up to 90% of them have visual access to nature to this green roof. Furthermore, it's a functioning ecosystem in the middle of a concrete jungle because I've worked in this office and several times over the course of the summer I worked there, you could see an American kestrel hunting smaller birds. So 
that's as literal a connection to nature as you can see because you're seeing ecosystems food chain play out. So it's, um, again, it's understandable how it's such a hard um, pattern or, uh, to implement. But it can be done through using aging or weathering materials such as copper, stone, cork and steel, um, or using visual, uh, visible hydrological cycles such as um, suds or water sensitive urban design. Now the second category of the patterns is natural analogs. These are organic, non-living, and indirect evocations of nature. Um, the objects, materials, colors, and shapes, and sequences, and patterns found in nature that are manifested as artwork, as furniture, as decor, and as textiles in the built environment. They are simply a mimicry of natural patterns. They provide an indirect connection with nature. While they are real, in a sense, our brain can tell that they're actually not real nature. So they do provide positive, um, restorative responses to the human body, but not as strong a response as actual uh, nature. However, they're extremely useful in projects uh, where living natural stimuli are not feasible or possible. So the first pattern of this category, which you come on to, is biomorphic forms and patterns. Now this can be simply explained by this photo here. This is from Eastside City Park in Birmingham. This is um, a sculpture made out of quartz and steel, so it reacts over time and oxidizes to an environment. That's um, one way of showing a connection to nature, a previous pattern. But uh, for biomorphic forms and patterns, this is showing the uh, vasco system of a leaf, and it's based on almost fractal-like patterns. And our brains have a uh, preference for processing um, fractal uh, images and fractal um, property or fractal patterns themselves of a certain uh, dimension dimensional ratio. So to incorporate biomorphic, uh, biomorphic forms and patterns, uh, you can utilize a number of numerical arrangements that are found in nature, such as florets, which are based on 120 degrees, the Fibonacci sequence, phyllotaxy, which is uh, uh, the number of uh, leaves and petals that form on plants. Um, and if possible, this pattern should be designed in three dimensions to allow for um, a greater richness of information and diversity. Now the next pattern in this category is material connection to nature. Uh, this utilizes materials and elements from nature through minimal processing that reflect the local geoecology to create a distinct sense of place. Um, this project is the Church of the Reconciliation located in uh, Berlin and it's made from, it's constructed from earth round walls and um, utilizing soil from the site itself so it's connecting uh, a very emotional place to um, the local geoecology of the area and the history that has passed through that area as well. The final pattern in this category is uh, complexity and order. And this is a very hard pattern to explain um, sometimes. So it's effectively rich sensory information that adheres to a spatial hierarchy similar to those encountered in nature. So again, this is what I was mentioning earlier on biomorphic forms and patterns and how our brains are um, built to process fractal patterns easier than um, information uh, easier than information presented in urban environments. So this pattern is about uh, repetition of patterns, details, and shapes. Um, when it incorporates fractal artwork, it should be of a certain dimensional ratio, um, usually um, in and uh, three iterations. So you can see here as this is the uh, roof terrace of the new library in Birmingham and the facade. So this uh, structural arrangement of the circles within the circle, it shows that spatial arrangement and, prov and provides uh, visual interest that, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, the final category of the patterns is nature of the space. And these are simply spatial configurations that are found in nature. So. From the previous two categories, we have the content within the space. We have actual nature, and then we have natural analogs. This uh, category is all about how we organize, organize all that information within the space itself. Now, this category covers the ability to see beyond our immediate, our immediate surroundings, our fascination with the slightly dangerous or unknown, obscured views and relatively moments, and sometimes even phobia-inducing properties when they include a trusted element of safety. And that last part goes back to earlier in the presentation where I mentioned that our uh, physiological system 
needs to be tested regularly, but only to a point where our body can remain adaptive and resilient. So the strongest responses in this category are achieved through um, the creation of deliberate and engaging uh, spatial configurations commingled with patterns of nature in the space and natural analogs. So the first of these patterns is prospect. Anyone who has done design, architecture, interior design, landscape design is very familiar with this pattern, prospect, prospect refuge theory. Um, it's simply an unimpeded view over a distance allowing for surveillance and planning and it's the ability to see from one space to another. Now the positive responses generated from this pattern are greater when the prospective view is from an elevated position and when you have the ability to see through several spaces at once. At once. It's important to balance this prospect with the next pattern in the series, um, which is refuge. Um, and this, it's, in terms of prospect when applying it, it's more important to provide one high quality um, pattern of prospect rather than uh, several instances of it as um, the higher quality perspective view would be a lot more effective at triggering a positive restorative response than multiple lower quality instances. So the viewing distances for uh, prospect views should be greater than 30 meters. Um, and when utilizing partitions in an office space, they should be no greater than one meter high as this allows individuals to see through uh, multiple spaces at once and allows um, a condition of prospect to exist. Uh, view sh view sheds, uh, what you can see from a prospective view should include um, elements in nature. Um, if it's a savanna-like environment, which uh, humans have a higher landscape preference for, savanna-like environments being uh, typified by grassland, uh, copses of trees, uh, presence of water, and evidence of human habitation. Now, um, and this links up to the next pattern, refuge, which is a place of concealment in which the occupant is usually protected from uh, behind and overhead and cannot easily be seen but allows easy access to outward prospect. It's not entirely enclosed, but rather provides some contact with surrounding environments for surveillance. You can think of refuge as a secondary space um, adjacent to the primary space. It, there should be spaces for people to retreat to from crowded areas, um, and they've been shown to have benefits on reducing uh, stress, uh, improving feelings of tranquility, and they do this by increasing people's uh, sense of comfort and safety as it gives them um, a space to uh, survey the environment from and plan their next move. Because um, how we progress through environments um, by having areas of refuge, they increase feelings um, of safety, especially when combined with prospect. So uh, linking these two patterns as well, or added as a complementary pattern, is the pattern of mystery. Um, and this is best explained by the Kaplans from their 1989 publication, Designing with People in Mind, that people have two basic needs in environments, to understand and to explore. So by uh, utilizing a focal point in the distance um, that is partially obscured, um, it entices individuals to explore the space further with the promise that um, the focal point will be revealed as well as more information will be revealed. So this is, um, can be an important uh, design element or design pattern to draw people through a space and lead into um, a destination point that the designer has specified. Um, this can link in to the final of the 14 patterns, peril, uh, also known as risk. I'm not trying to say that Grand Can uh, walking by Grand Canal Plaza is a uh, risk or perilous. Um, I've chosen this project because um, of the extended platform leading to the water's edge it allows people to um, experience an inert danger. Um, so it's seeing an identifiable threat with um, a, a visible safeguard as well. And this pattern has been shown to be important in childhood development as it allows the development of risk assessment. In adults, um, experiences of risk and peril can cause the release of short doses of dopamine in the body. This in turn supports motivation, memory, problem solving, and the fight or flight response. However, this pattern is not appropriate for all user groups or project, or project types due to its nature. And that is true for all the patterns as well. Um, they need to be project and user specific and respond to the context in hand. So now moving on to the constraints and opportunities of implementing biofilm design. 
So the present ethos of urban design is to create sustainable environments. This must change to a wider scope to encompass health and well-being as part of a wider salutogenic approach to health rather than a preventive approach to health. Biophilic design, by its very reasoning as being a new design ethic, refocuses the designer on the interaction between the occupant and the built environment. This re uh, refocus allows um, biophilia to become part of a wider integrative uh, strategy, where it's seen as an integral upon, um, component. In terms of opportunities, um, momentum behind biophilic design has been building considerably over the past few years. You have the publication of Terrapin Bright Green's uh, Economics of Biophilia, the 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design. You have the Human Spaces or Interfaces International uh, or Global Report. You have uh, the rise of the Well Building Standard. You have the International Society for Biourbanism, the launch of the Biophilic Cities Project, with Birmingham being the closest uh, participant in that project. And you also have the Living Building Challenge, all of which incorporate um, biophilia as well. So now this section of the presentation is going to cover um, variability in the built environment. So this is how variable factors in the built environment affect um, the efficacy and effectiveness of biophilic design patterns uh, in their implementation. So in terms of climate, ecology, and vernacular, vernacular um, architecture is a response to the regional ecologies that humans find themselves in. It is utilization of materials, forms, and functions that respond to uh, topography, climate, and this in turn helps connect individuals to their place by reflecting the local geoecology. So um, vernacular architecture should be widely considered when implementing biophilic design patterns. In terms of climate and ecology, not all natural or temperate environments are green. Um, while some habitats might engender a stronger uh, restorative response than others, um, coastal areas um, can indeed also be biophilic, as can desert um, areas as well. Um, and then moving on to climate change, it brings with it um, threats to the health for ecosystems and the services that those ecosystems provide. Um, restoration can be thought of as an ecosystem service, so by climate change impacting upon the shifting of species worldwide in their geographic ranges, leading to species displacement and habitat loss. It's important that we uh, incorporate biophilic design um, in a measure and climate change into how we um, preserve um, our environments and species and also how biophilic environments respond and remain resilient in the face of climate change. Uh, next category in variability in the built environment is character, density, and typology. Um, in terms of typology, in rural environments, human nature interactions are abundant and restoration is much easier to trigger in a natural rural environment simply because our brains are processed to, or our brains are hardwired to process information in nature um, easier than the information that is presented to us in an urban environment. So in urban environments, you have traffic lights, you have cars, uh, you have dangers, you're paying attention to where you're walking, where you're going, etc. Whereas in rural environments, you don't have any of that. Where your brain in urban environments is processing so much information, it can lead to sensory overload and um, mental fatigue. When you're um, viewing or in a natural environment, your brain is able to process the information um, visually and, and through your sense of hearing as well um, because we involve in those types of environments. And it's able to process that information with such ease that it's not um, expending um, a huge amount of energy. So your cognitive processes are allowed to restore and recover and this leads to greater cognitive and concentration and performance. Um, also leading to character density and typology, um, space within urban areas is extremely limited. So incorporating biofilic design patterns or numerous or several of the biofilic design patterns would not always be possible. Um, and this is simply due to space or area demands of certain patterns such as prospect um, or uh, refuge, mystery, and peril. So the solution to this lies to creating what's known as micro-restorative experiences. These are experiences with nature which aren't strong enough or rich enough in detail information to trigger a biophilic response. But when you place several uh, micro-restorative experiences along a highly used pedestrian path or um, a throughway area of traffic, 
um, by an individual experiencing several of those micro restorative experiences, uh, they accumulate over time and lead to a restorative response. If an individual is not stressed um, or does not require uh, restoration to take place, those restorative experiences over the course of a day or experiencing them can actually help buffer an individual to a psychological stress or death they will encounter at a later date or a later time within that or a short time within that period afterwards. Sorry, I love this all. Um, this is from Parkin Day 2013. This is a parklet that was done by uh, Marion Kyo. Um, and the theme was reflecting um, about our need for um, talking about commercial needs in the city and where the secure plans from, from garden centers located within the city centers themselves. So it is about and sense about connection to nature. Um, now this is talking about uh, scale and uh, feasibility. So biophilic design patterns should be scaled to their surrounding environmental context and the user population needs. Uh, size and availability are two of the biggest issues affecting feasibility of biophilic design patterns. As I mentioned before, some patterns such as prospect and mystery um, are um, demanding of space. However, um, the partner prospect can still be um, implemented in a um, smaller space by using an external view. So by setting the space and by being able to see uh, the view from an external space, uh, where it's down the road or where it's from an office block window. It's also worth mentioning that um, small spaces can indeed be biophilic because studies have shown, uh, a study by Robert Fuller in 2007, showed that um, psychological benefits in nature increase with biodiversity or with higher levels of biodiversity, uh, biodiversity instead of increases in land area or vegetative, vegetative cover. So by utilizing um, a biodiverse space or incorporating a greater diversity of biophilic design patterns, you can create a restorative response within a smaller space. Now we move on to culture and demographics, which can affect the um, effectiveness of biophilic design patterns. And simply put, contemporary landscape preferences are influenced by human evolution. While there's a degree of uh, universe, uh, universal landscape preferences, these have been influenced by cultural constructs, past experiences, and socioeconomic factors. So what's worth pointing out that biophilia is um, uh, built into us, it's genetic, it's true evolution. Um, it's also part of it is influenced by um, our social constructs uh, and by our experiences to date. So part of it is genetic, part of it is learned. And in terms of demographics, um, all groups value nature, but they utilize and interact to them, uh, with nature in different ways that are compatible with their needs. Um, this underlies the importance of identifying these needs of these various groups um, early on, helping to define the parameters for appropriate design strategies and interventions. Um, and this can be highlighted by a 2009 Dutch paper, um, where it was found that uh, Middle Eastern immigrants in Western Europe had lower rates of green space usage compared to white Europeans. Um, the paper found that this was due to varying cultural landscape preferences, um, so on one side you had a wilder and naturalistic uh, style or preference for green spaces versus a very formal green space with evidence of human care and intervention. And these two um, style of preferences can be called uh, the ecological aesthetic and the aesthetics of care. Um, so while landscape preferences are, strongly, are also strongly influenced by an individual's levels of ecological literacy, so this is a, an individual's ability to know local species, to name plants, to uh, know about uh, natural processes and geological processes. Um, so those with higher levels of ecological literacy prefer wilder landscapes, while at the other spectrum, um, individuals with lower levels of um, ecological literacy prefer more tamed landscapes. And another factor considered, um, the final one covering on this, is environmental generational amnesia. Um, so Environmental generational amnesia describes the shifting baseline for what is considered to be a normal environmental condition. So as environmental degradation continues, the baseline continues to shift with each ensuing generation. So the next generation perceives the degraded condition as the non-degraded condition. 
Um, this can be easily explained by a village next to a forest. Then it happens to the village, cut down half the forest, the next generation comes along, thinks of the forest as a whole, they cut down half the forest, the next generation comes along and thinks of that forest as the whole non-degraded condition, and the forest is a quarter of its original size. So environmental gener generational amnesia can significantly influence um, how people or what people perceive to be natural. So it's clearly important that we need to have biophilic environments. So how can we ensure that re they remain effective? Well, in terms of climate change, we can use climate adaptive and resilient uh, plant species that can respond to species displacement uh, through climate change. Another method is using um, a biophilic design strategy known as dynamic layering. This is using uh, multiple patterns to complement one another and combine them together. So if one pattern fails, um, another pattern or secondary pattern can take over and keep and maintain restorative responses effective. Um, these patterns can be said to be uh, dormant and said to become or latent and become active when the primary pattern uh, becomes dormant due to seasonality or changes um, in the built environment. Another factor is to use inclusive uh, biophilic design. Um, biophilic design is a design ethic itself, by its own definition, must create inclusive environments to enhance the health and well-being of all members of society. Where response rates to biophilic environments varying greatly between groups of society, it is vital that designers understand um, these differences and why they occur, as biophilic environments can act as catalysts for social interaction and integration. Designers should study which biophilic design elements have universal appeal to various groups. And finally, as mentioned previously before, we have micro-restorative green space networks. So these can be used by, or by creating micro-restorative experiences. These can be done across um, all scales of the urban fabric, from the interior office environment to the street level to the local park, to parklets, micro-restorative spaces, to the reuse of brownfield land as retrofitted green space. So I timed this nicely. Coming on to my last slide, um, biophilia and biophilic design is often purported to be the missing link in creating sustainable environments. Well, biophilic environments that establish a connection between nature and occupants of the built environment, we won't stop one of the most exacerbating factors in climate change, our behavior. Studies of immersion in natural environments and connections to nature, especially during childhood, have shown um, higher levels of environmental stewardship as adults, increased ecological literacy, and the adoption of more sustainable behaviors, all of which play their part in reducing the impact of climate change. So why biophilia is not a magical cure for all our problems, it should be utilized more as part of an integrative design process. So I've thrown a huge amount of information at you all. I have not been able to cover all of the complex details of biophilic design. I have unfairly skipped over um, some issues as well, which affect implementation and the adoption, um, you know, and further adoption of biophilic design um, in the built environment. So I encourage you to check out the 14 patterns of biophilic design. It's available for free download from Terrapin Bright Green's um, website. Um, I also encourage you to look at the Economics of Biophilia, also published by Terrapin Bright Green. You have the global, space, uh, the global report by Human Spaces or Interface as well. Um, yep, and I encourage you to also check out the Well Building Standard as well. That's developing and the Living Building Challenge, which incorporate uh, biophilia um, within its rating system. So I'm going to leave you now with this quote. Um, we cannot win this battle to save species and environments without forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well for we will not fight to save what we do not love. Thank you very much for attending tonight. It's been a pleasure to speak to you all. I think that's um, important to read as well in terms of recycling as well, and it does have um, 
implications for on behavior and also connection to nature. And it does give higher awareness to um, ecological processes and impacts of manufacturing environment and design. Yeah, definitely. Great regarding architect and the chemist between each one. Mm, that's great, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the connection with biophilia, can you, can you tell us a bit more about what's going on there? Well, the well building standard um, was developed by uh, DELOS um, in New York. Um, it's been adopted by the US Green Building Council, um, and it focuses on um, interior environments uh, primarily um, for building environments, and it focuses on, as the name suggests, the health and well being of building occupants, and it's everything from air quality to um, ergonomics, but it does incorporate biophilia into it as well um, to a large extent. And this is about connections to nature, reducing stress, and um, improving uh, cognitive function to maintain um, performance in offices, higher productivity levels, and lower rates of absenteeism. Um, it's taken off to a huge extent uh, stateside, and it is, uh, growing more. It's um, becoming quite popular in the UK at the minute and I believe is going to take off in Ireland here shortly as well. Is that so. a benchmark standard, is it? Essentially, yes. Um, I th think they're bringing introductory uh, prices for the minute uh, for people who take the well AP exam for the registration of projects. And I believe that ends in June 2017, but it has uh, had a massive uptake um, in the UK uh, as well from my experience. Was, that's where I'm based, but um, I would predict in Ireland it is within the next year, it will take off. What do you think the challenges are in terms of the architecture and the association That's a controversial question. <laughs> um, first off, I, I would say, and this isn't just even uh, specific to Ireland, but I think education is one of the biggest hurdles to overcome. Um, because of biophilic design, it's, it's not even knowing about the definition about biophilia. Because it, it is a simple thing. Everyone, whether you're a designer, architect, or a landscape architect, you want to create a connection to nature for the people you're designing for. You want them to be able to enjoy a space. Um, what biophilic design is, is defining the parameters for how people actually go about doing that. Because now we have 60, 70 years of research backing up what people actually like about spaces. There's a combination from uh, neuroscience, architecture, evolutionary psychology, um, et cetera, like that. So I think in terms of Ireland and wider as well, you need to approach it with two prongs. You need a module on biophilic design for all built environment design uh, third level courses. And for already practicing professionals, you need um, further CPD events where you need wire uptake of the well building standard. And on a side note for landscape architects, well, the well building st standard might apply more for architects and interior designers and architects. Um, there's an, been a launch by, uh, it's been backed by the American Society of Landscape Architects called uh, the Sites Initiative, which incorporates biophilia as well. So I think wider adoption of that could lead to greater implementation. But I think with the current situation in Ireland at the minute, can't even get houses built. So in terms of implementing biofuel design, yeah, I'm, I'm, there's hope, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of problems in the way and a lot of factors. But I think it starts with education at the base level, and from there it will grow to, you know, from the professional to the policy makers and such as that. So I think that is the, the number one thing that needs to be sorted at this present time. Actually, on, on that one, I had a related thought as well because I was wondering, like you, you referred to an awful lot of the benefits and the, the positivity that can come out of it. Mm. But I was wondering, is there any research into the payoff? Because in a commercial environment, yeah. so these people operate in, until you can show the, the payoff, yeah. then the, the money men aren't going to kind of, uh, it would be a nice to have rather than a need to have. Yeah. So is there, is there research into that? Um, the Economics of Biophilia by Terrapin Bright Green um, lists all those and it is directly. Um, Looked at well, it's looked at developers and looked at office building managers, etc., and interior environments. It's everything from increases in productivity to lower rates of absenteeism to um, negating uh, the phenomenon known as presenteeism, where people come into the office when they're sick and they're not supposed to, or they're not engaged at work. As I mentioned before, um, there was a study done 
uh, on a building at the University of Oregon, I believe, um, which showed that 10% of employee absenteeism rates could be applied to um, lack of a connection to nature uh, within architecture features within an office. So simply by reducing your absentee rates by 10%, it's going to have massive savings in terms of well, financial and um, greater uplifts in productivity as well. Darren says, yes, you can. Um, that's, a lot of that would be covered under the category of biofilm design patterns known as uh, natural analogs. Um, it is beneficial, it is definitely a strategy to doing so because it does provide the same benefits in terms of reduction in stress and improved uh, cognitive functioning. Um, the only drawback to it is that our brains can tell that it's not real. Um, so although it's, it does deliver a positive response, it's not real nature. It doesn't deliver a strong response as um, actual inter interaction with nature. But it is a um, definitely a viable strategy, um, especially in interior environments where uh, incorporating living natural stimuli is not feasible. It's not possible due to space requirements, uh, soil, health and safety regulations, etc. So utilizing natural analogs, non-living indirect uh, vocations of nature is, is a definite strategy to enhancing well-being within a building environment. Um, there are a lot of the studies that have been done that are, are stem from horticulture therapy, so uh, utilized in gardens for um, youth gardening programs, um, horticulture therapy programs in um, prisons, in um, care facilities as well. And they have all been shown to whether it's just simply taking care of a plant or whether it's that connection to nature as well, especially for um, uh, urban children as well, that connection to nature, know where their food is coming from has been showing, because um, effectively growing your own food is a effective mechanism for showing a connection to nature to show how natural processes work. So you're developing um, an individual sense of ecological literacy as well. So there have been studies that have shown positive benefits in doing that as well. Um, I, I think the difference is, I think that is because of higher levels of access to education. So people have, are more aware of issues such as climate change, of the important role of ecosystems, and um, a more developed sense of uh, ecological literacy as well. Because, well, for one, in climate change, they're more aware of it because we're seeing more and more the visible effects of it. Um, so I think, yes, that could definitely be a flip side to environmental generational amnesia. Um, actually, when utilizing either a non-visual or visual connection in nature, um, if you combine the two where you have um, a visual pattern and um, where you engage your sight and your hearing, for example, at the same time, uh, the two patterns together create a stronger biophilic response than they would by themselves individually. So that's why, as a, in terms of implementing biophilic design, it's, also, it's recommended to incorporate a diversity of patterns that complement each other and that work together because it creates uh, a stronger response and leads to a sensory rich environment. Yeah. 
Oh. Okay. Well, maybe on that note, I'd ask you to show your appreciation again for Joseph. I really.